Hi, my name is Lorna Grant. I have a BA in English major and a minor in psychology from Waterford Institute of Technology and an MA in English from UCC. My paper is on Theresa Davies, the King of Spain's daughter, and the effects of generational patriarchy and misogynistic principles, and looking at how they're exposed, explored through the four characters in the play. Theresa Davies' plays reveal the reality of everyday life for the ordinary Irish person exposing the corrupt, insidious patriarchy that become ingrained into all aspects of Irish life, an ideology of collective societal acceptance of male aggression, leading to violent and incomprehensible acts against Irish women. All part of a Phoenician-driven rebirth from English rule, the 1922 treaty was a reason for hope, possibilities of new beginnings to create a new, independent, modern, progressive society. Instead, Ireland became more reminiscent of misogynistic 17th, 18th century England. Ireland's mothers, daughters and sisters were possessions of fathers, sons and brothers. Men ruled the house and violence against women was normalised, sanctioned all by a misogynistic state and church. Irish theatre had been a place where the wrongs under an oppressive English regime could be exposed, with female figures such as Lady Gregory, who was heavily involved in the Abbey Theatre. Basically, there was... Quote, no obstacle, Irish women in the early 20th century were part of a broadly based cultural revolution in which women played a significant part. See Murray, page 1-2, end quote. That was all to change as women playwrights began to disappear from Irish theatre. It discusses generational patriarchy within Irish society within Devi's play The King of Spain's Daughter, exploring ways the ideology and misogynistic principles are symbolised within the four characters, using themes of patriarchal manipulation, same-sex betrayal, normalisation of violence and attraction to aggression. Investigates the effect on both the male and female psyches and female identity, exposing consequences of a legacy of generational patriarchy that is still an issue today. With an increase in aggressive behaviours in women, it will explore the modern-day cinema representation of female anti-heroes, showing similarities between Annie Kinsler and Harley Quinn. The stage is set with restricted barriers either side. There's a doorway that leads to an open field, but the reality of restricted patriarchy has not yet been fully comprehended. In the characters, Devi exposes an older generation that's accepted normalisation of oppression and aggression against women, how women wrong women to keep the status quo, and the youth eventually are conditioned into patriarchal systems. The play embodies reality of life for Irish women, and harmful damage on the psyche of men and women through cognitive dissonance. As Keeley, page 179, suggests, quote, DB exposes how restrictive social and religious orthodoxies corralled women and men into reduced ways of being. End quote. The play warns of the inherent dangers in continuous ideology, ideological social systems and misogynistic principles that are today still experienced. Fox, page 16, quote, argues long standing cultural acceptance of female inferiority has imprinted a psychic cultural memory that lingers and continues to motivate beliefs and behaviour despite change. End quote. Previous feminist philosophers argued against male-oriented philosophies, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau's, who claimed that women must be subservient to men for the good of society and protection of the human race, that there must be a balance, quote, one sex must be strong and active, the other weak and passive, page 125. Wolven Stonecraft responded in a vindication of the rights of women, highlighting the inherent dangers of gender inequality, that such philosophy left women open to mistreatment and abuse, unable to gain independence, left them vulnerable to dangers and deprivation. Page 1167. End quote. For Wolfenstonecraft, Rousseau's philosophy would produce a manipulative, vindictive and aggressive creature. Quote, a being who patiently endures injustices and silently bears insults will soon become unjust or unable to discern right from wrong. Page 1. Five, six, end quote. More recent feminist theories investigate the historic nature of patriarchy through ancient and modern belief systems that are reinforced by ideology and long-held cultural practices. Fox, page 16. As Fox, page 28, suggests, quote, in order to achieve and maintain subordination of the female, ideologies have been constructed whereby submission to the patriarchy appear in the nature of things. Ordained by gods, supported by the priests, implemented by law, women came to accept and to psychologically internalise compliance as necessary. Taking up the mantle from the worries and petticoats, 
DB also shows the effects of generational patriarchy and enforced misogynistic principles from a male perspective in the character of Jim Harris. Mrs. Marks enters a restricted area on stage carrying a heavy bas basket. Asking Jim for permission to enter, they begin a conversation about a wedding just taking place. In her pessimistic response, Mrs. Marks refers to the young bride as a poor young thing. Page 2. Openly confiding in Jim her own reality of marriage. I was thinking of my own marriage day when I was looking at them too. It's a thought that would sadden anyone. Page 4. Jim suggests she didn't fare bad. She replies, bad. What bad or God good got to do with it? That's outside the question. For 20 years you're thinking of that day, and for 30 years you're looking back at it. After that you don't mind. You have the feeling. Except maybe an odd day, like today. Page 4. Keenly page 12 suggests, Irish women were most often resigned to accepting unhappy conditions and unhappy relationships. End quote. Jim has been introduced to the realism of marriage within the patriarchy. The interaction highlights the damage from generational patriarchy where Jim's own useful potential and imaginative possibilities are eroded through subtle cohesion. As the play progresses, Jim's soft-hearted approach towards Annie is condemned and ridiculed by both Mrs. Marks and Peter. Felicity arrives on stage whistling, showing a carefree nature. When Peter talks aggressively and threatening of Annie being late with his dinner, Jim attempts to downplay the situation. This on the count of that wedding. She'll be up now. They don't feel the time of the weather when they're waiting for the bride. Page one. Peter complains Annie is more than likely off with Brody Man philandering. Jim replies, if she goes a bit on a bit herself, it is because she must. She's made that way. She can't help it. Page one. Jim's dialogue with Peter suggests a willingness for understanding in his defense of Annie, an openness to equality, understanding Annie's need for the experience of sexual intimacy, likely due to his own needs and similar behaviour. Quote, There's no doubt traditional assumptions of the role of women mirrored the teachings of the Catholic Church, which was used to justify legislation that limited opportunities for women. Be amount, page 564, end quote. On to Peter's demands, why don't you marry herself and stop her going on? Jim's reply, I want that and you know it. How can I force the girl? Shows he believes Annie has the right to choose. However, Peter's condescending response, Aye, how indeed, laughs contemptuously. Aye, you're very young, page two, highlights the coercion and manipulation used for maintaining the patriarchy constructs can again be subtle. Peter's remarks insinuate Jim can or should force Mary, Annie to marry him. French and Belida suggest, quote, Men are dependent on each other to maintain the dominance of women, and thus the status quo, page 18, end quote. Peter is quick to insert this dominance when Jim attempts to disrupt the status quo. Annie, in stage directions, goes off with a backward glance at Jim. Jim would follow, but for Peter's forbidden look. When Jim asks, can't you leave her alone? Peter replies, does she belong to you? Does she? When she does, you can talk, page 6. The silent pause exposes Jim's own powerlessness. Peter has all the power and control over Annie unless Jim conforms to the ideology. The contribution of Mrs. Marx exposes how women become complicit in the patriarchy, enable it to remain in place from one generation to the next. Quote, the establishment of patriarchy was not one event, but developing process. Lerner, page 8, end quote. Dinnerstein and Honeycutt, page 564, quote, both men and women are complicit in the systems of male dominance as they both create and sustain power arrangements, end quote. Candioti explains, a woman will participate in the ideology in order to maximise her own life, page 2812, end quote. Similar, in Wolverstone Crafts Maria, in order to move in, Jemima advises a father of an unborn child to turn his young pregnant girlfriend out. Unable to return home, the girl is found dead in a water trough. Page 33 to 34. And Jemima's ability to survive has been restricted through patriarchal structures. In order to maximise her life, she disengages her morality and wrongs another woman. Fox suggests, quote, historically women were easily subdued because of their inferior strength. Given opportunity, they protect themselves by participating in the patriarchal bargain. Page 17, end quote. Mrs. Marks begins to betray Annie by informing Peter that she's seen Annie off across the field with that ruddy man. Dee exposes a sinister side of female collusion in the patriarchy, with Mrs. Marks as co-spirator in the ideology and its acceptance of violence against women. When Annie finds out she's late, she's alarmed. He'll have my life! Mrs. Marks responds, ah, small blame to himself, page 5, 
highlights Mrs. Mark's lack of sympathy and her opinion Peter's punishment is justified. It's actually Jim who gets Mrs. Mark's protection as she warns him, don't be drawn into it, you, to be a mistake. Keep your eyes on the ground, it's the safest place. You won't see what's happening, you won't lose your head. Page five. It appears by ignoring the true situation is the way Mrs. Mark's older generation responds to the oppression and violence suffered by their younger counterparts. Mrs. Marx is ensuring Jim does not draw attention to any defiance of the ideology, yet she's no problem placing Annie at the centre of her father's aggression. Belita describes the ideology as, quote, persuasive and cohesive, but also covert and manipulative, page 20, end quote. Mrs. Marx appears to be Dee's version of Wolfenstone Craft's manipulative creature. Endorsing violence against women by disengaging her morality, she loses her ability to discern right from wrong. Mrs. Mark's reaction to the violence suffered by Annie is further evidence of her same-sex betrayal, along with her continuous manipulation of Jim into abiding by the misogynistic principles against Annie's welfare. Concerned Peter will have Annie's life, Mrs. Marks replies, Annie earns what she gets, and that Jim is too self-hearted, page three. When Peter hits out at Annie, Jim springs forward. Mrs. Marks catches Jim by the arm, stage directions, page five, warning him, Supposing you were to get a blow yourself instead of herself, what good would that be? It might do you a grievous harm. Great cheer to see her standing upright if yourself was lying low. Page six. When Annie cries out, Jim starts forward. Mrs. Marks catches his arm. Be a man now. Be a man. And don't get yourself hurt. Page six. Annie returns a little dishevelled and frightened, nursing her soldier. shoulder. Page seven. Mrs. Marks tells Jim, Now strengthen your heart, quite your mind. We get what we merit. Don't be moved to any foolish compassion. The hard man wins. Page 7. D.B. highlights the hypocrisy in the ideology of an acceptance of violence against Annie by a heavy-built man and the co-conspirator's protection of Jim as he interferes with the ex execution of patriarchal practices. With the patriarchy, quote, women who violate the normal standards of female behaviour may no longer benefit from the privilege of male protection. Honeycutt, page 566, end quote. Jim may be romantically interested but cannot offer protection. Annie must submit first. Along with encouraging Jim, Mrs. Mark nitpicks at Annie's character, telling Jim she's a bold, wild thing who'll be romancing all her life with whoever she can. She'll do you no good, page three. If you marry that girl, don't believe a word she'll tell you, page six. Jim's attitude begins to change towards Annie. After she returns, disheveled and frightened, Jim sits and waits. When Annie comes to him, he does refer to the violence. He hurt you then. Did he do you any harm? However, he catches her wrist first. Page 7. Annie downplays the violence, talks to the wedding instead. Jim interrupts. Does it shame you'd madden him? He'll harm you some day, and all your own fault. You won't have any life left, and what can I do? Page 7. Jim is now holding Annie responsible for the violence and admitting he can't stop it. Billy to page 30 argues, quote, Patriarchy has carried out a process of cultural socialization that has normalized male dominance, violence, and control in human relationships. End quote. Annie continues to talk. Jim springs up. What well, lies you're telling? I saw her myself. She was dressed in grey and she had no flowers. Page seven. Mrs. Mark's manipulation is having an effect. Jim no longer sees a world of bright colours through imaginative eyes. His heart's been hardened, it's all dull and lifeless. D.B. exposes the psychological manipulation of Jim as he submits to the ideology. Jim is learning to express his dominance and physical power over Annie. Quote, Keeley suggests, in the action of Jim's holding, crushing and restraining Annie, Jim inhabits his body differently, and led by Peter's dominance and Mrs. Mark's encouragement, enacts the violent behaviour in which he's been instructed. Page 185. The character of Katie in Dee's play Katie Roach also suffers physical violence by her father Reuben. Unhappily married to an older man Stan, Reuben lectures Katie on the proper behaviour of a wife. Katie responds scornfully and Reuben beats her viciously with a stick. Peter and Reuben both use violence to gain dominance and control, while Jim and Stan become complicit when persuasion fails. Leahy, page 590. Quote, Leahy suggests, violence within the privacy of domestic settings lies at the centre of Dee's place. Page 591, end quote. D.B. explores the way the female identity reacts within the patriarchy's systems and misogynistic principles. Quote, patriarchy imposes masculinity and femininity character stereotypes in society, which strengthen the iniquitous power relations between men and women, 
a wet page 44, end quote. Both Annie and Katie react disturbingly to the violence. They don't acknowledge it, simply shrug it off with a complete lack of self-pity, an impression of inevitability. By upsetting the balance, they get what they earn. Annie is beaten down physically and psychologically. Accepting marriage to Jim, it appears she's conformed to the ideology. However, responding to Mrs. Mark's reality of marriage and children, Annie, under Annie understands how the female biology is used for subordination and exploitation within the patriarchy. Mrs. Mark, well, well, if you could get to care for him, that'd be a blessing from God. It might come to you later. Some time you do, more time you don't. It might come with a child. Annie, I dread that. Page 13. Annie's feminine identity is morphed from nurturer to one who avoids nurturing. Quote, patriarchy is rooted in genetic sexual differences and the related gender socialized behaviors between men and women that these generate. The leader, page 19, end quote. Fox suggests, quote, historically women were easily subdued because of their inferior strength and nurturing tasks. Page 17, end quote. Annie's aware by controlling her reproductive biology is a way of dissociating with her female identity, gaining power within and against the patriarchy and its practices. Annie says, it will not be all they say of me, she married Jimmy Harris, page 13. Annie begins to resemble Wolverstone Cross, manipulative creature, cunningly obtaining power. It's a reality of the kind of female identity created through generational patriarchy. The play raises concerns relating to consequences for humanity from generational patriarchy, exploring psychological adaptions and disturbances within the female psyche. In Annie's interactions with Jim and her reluctant acceptance of marriage, Annie reconciles her psyche with imaginative disturbing thoughts. She has formed an attraction to Jim's obsessive, aggressive and violent traits. Annie's last lines, boy, she laughs exuberantly, I think he's a man might cut your throat, Annie. He put by two shillings every week for 200 weeks. I think he's a man that, supposing he was jealous, might cut your throat. Quite exudent, she goes, page 14. The leader suggests, quote, when presented with power, if we ignore it, we're at risk of not surviving. But if we respond to it, then we become an unwilling party to its influence, page 25, end quote. Unable to reconcile her psyche with that of an Irish wife, Annie conceptualizes another. What life is open to interpretation? From Keeley's research, the 1935 production differed from the original script. Mrs. Mark's line is omitted. It left audience either confused or concluding that Annie was running away. In 1939 production, Mrs. Mark's line is reinstated. Keeley argues that this, quote, changes the dynamics of the final moments, that Annie's emotional and psychological reaction to her realization that Jim is potentially violent is one of exhortation. This with Mrs. Mark's last line is what Curly refer, Keeley refers to as, quote, a stark warning and call to feminist activists. Keeley, page 187. Additionally, the play is an exploration into the inherent dangers associated with misogynistic principles within generational patriarchy. Younger generations are forced into a maelstrom of misogynistic principles and female identity is created through inflictions of these same principles. Today, equality in education, workplace opportunities and legislation has been achieved, but aggressive behaviour and violence remains a serious issue. A recent article by Daily suggests that one in five women experience a form of abuse from a current or former partner, and Women's Aid have launched a Two Into You campaign, suggested of a narcissistic need for control and dominance over young women. Quote, violence towards women in all its forms has and still exists in such an environment where Psychological compliance has been ingrained. Fox, page 28. End quote. Repercussions from generational patriarchy. Recent research also shows an increase in aggressive and violent behaviour by women, with, quote, significant increase of women being convicted of violent crimes. Chung, end quote. Psychologist Albert Bandura's learning theory of operant conditioning suggests, quote, children can learn aggressiveness from parents who behave aggressively. Also that children who are physically abused are likely to grow up becoming aggressive. Davison et al. page 488. There's been an influx of superhero and anti-hero modern cinema movies with strong kiss-ass women that prove they can be as violent and aggressive as their male counterparts. The Avengers franchise, the females prove their physical strength in many combat scenes and intellect in strategic battle planning. 
In Endgame, the female Avengers Unite scene shows the heroines fighting for the survival of the world, while the villains fight for one madman's ideology. In comparison, Suicide Squad's Harley Quinn forms an attraction to the aggressive, mad and violent Joker. Helping him escape, she's physically hurt by him and left behind. Refusing to give up on her pudding, Harley proves her feelings, loyalty and craziness jumping into a vat of acid. The Joker saves her and she emerges with a changing appearance and enters a toxic relationship. Harley has similarities to Dee Dee's Annie. They both start out as young, vibrant women who form attraction to aggressive and violent men who both use manipulation and cohesion on the young women. They both accept the violent tendencies that come with their men and are influenced by the dominant power structures and protection the men provide. In order to survive this love relationship, their mental perception changes and morality is disengaged to adapt. These behaviours could be the change in female identity D.B. warns of as Harley begins becomes the modern-day Annie. However, in the Birds of Prey movie, Harley now is single, independent and fighting with a quote, group of women against violently entitled men and the institutions that enable them. Tillerson's end quote. Possible warning for the co-conspirators of a future where patriarchy is dismantled, leaving Mrs. Marks with just her basket of burdens. In conclusion, Deeby's play exposes the harsh reality of life for Irish women. While the phoenix may have risen for some, Irish women's hope became nothing but ash. Irish women were reduced to subservient biological bodies. The King of Spain's daughter is not, LG, is not as JL writes, a delightful little play about a romantic girl. Indeed, through the characters, Dee Dee exposes a legacy of generational patriarchy with the manipulation of Jim and betrayal of Annie. Dee Dee's warning follows through into modern day, with violence against women an ongoing issue and an increase in aggressive and violent behaviours in women. With similarities to Annie, Harley Quinn becomes a modern-day Annie for a while. However, empowerment and independence allows Harley to blaze a trailer colour in a world that Deavy's Annie deserved. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation.